All right, what's happening, y'all? It's your boy Rico from Street Scores, and we're coming with the post-free agency seven-round mock draft. We're going to trade back up into the first round with this one. We're going to get and build around a franchise quarterback with this mock draft. This is the post-Sam Howell trade mock draft and everything. It's also very Maryland heavy. I'm not going to lie, that wasn't necessarily my goal going into the mock draft, but with the players that I selected, I just started to notice a pattern. We'll break that down as we get through this draft. There's a lot of great players from Maryland that ended up at different teams, and hey man, maybe they end up making a full circle back to the team that plays in Landover. But before we dive into all of that, make sure you stiff arm that like button, stiff arm the subscription button, and stiff arm the bell next to that subscription button so you get a notification each and every time I release an informative and opinionated video just like this one. Also, make sure you go follow the channel on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, all of that, man. I have the link in the description of this video and every video moving on. So make sure you stay tuned in those spaces as well. And man, I really appreciate y'all. Stay tuned. This is the mock draft. Now I got to double back and talk about the Jamison Crowder signing. I got to talk about the FL Bada signing. I promise y'all I'm going to get that to y'all soon. So stay tuned for all of the content. I have a lot more creative ideas on the way as well, especially Draft Center. And I'm coming with a cap space update and a breakdown of everybody's cap hits and things like that. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get to this video though let's get it adam adam All right, so first of all, like you can see in the title, I'm combining like three different mock drafts that I would normally do separately. I'm putting them all in one mock because this is the post free agency mock draft. So now we have a better understanding of what our exact needs are going into the draft. This is after the Sam Howell trade. I was thinking about doing a mock draft just strictly for that as well. And then this is also a trade back up into the first round mock. The reason I combine them all is just because I feel like the needs that came from the post free agency and Sam Howell trade needed to be addressed immediately. And I just so happened to want to trade back up into the first round, especially to get a tackle, especially after what we've done in free agency. So I just felt like instead of making them three separate mock drafts and milking it, I'll just combine them all into one. And also, Recently, like a few days ago, the Vikings sent the Texans their second round pick, a sixth round pick, and a 2025 second rounder. And in return, they got the Texans 23rd first round pick and their seventh round pick as well. So basically, to trade back up into the first, I hit the Cincinnati Bengals up, gave them an offer for us to move back up into the first round and take their first round pick, and they accepted it. So I sent them our first second round pick our fifth round pick and our next year's second rounder to get back into their 18th overall pick in the first round and their seventh round pick as well and pro football focuses mock draft simulator actually accepted the trade in the first attempt of that as well i put the trade together myself based off of the trade that the vikings and texans had and then when i put it in the pro football focus mock draft simulator just to kind of do like a just in case check real quick just to make sure this thing is valid and it got accepted so then 2024 wise we would end up with two first round picks, one second round pick, three thirds, zero fourths, one fifth round pick, zero sixth round picks, and then two seventh round picks. That's still nine draft picks, but now we have two in the first and again, one in the second and still three in the third. And yeah, we'll miss that second rounder next year in the 2025 draft, but getting two top 18 picks in the first round of this draft is crazy with this many good tackles, especially. And also, before we dive into this mock draft, the only thing that I wish I did was take a corner sooner in the draft. But at the end, I give y'all a corner that's a super sleeper and a perfect fit for what Dan Dan Quinn and Joe Wood Jr. want to do with their defense. This guy that I'm going to give y'all should be going in the third round, but I have us taking him like way later because I just want to put y'all on to him. I didn't want to just completely leave him out of the video anyway. So without further ado, let's go ahead and go into this mock draft. And again, remember, I did not take corner as soon as I really feel like we should take him. I'm going to save that for the next mock draft, but I still wanted to give y'all a guy that's like a super sleeper and maybe I'll pick him in my next mock draft as well. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get to it. Round one, second overall, Lav is taking quarterback Drake May from UNC. And even though I do prefer Jada Daniels, let's get that out the way. And by a decent gap, in my personal opinion. But first of all, I like both quarterbacks a lot. 
And I feel like this coaching staff can get greatness out of either guy. Like, again, like I keep saying, I feel like if Jaden Daniels didn't exist, we would all be excited about Drake May. And if Drake May didn't exist, we would all be excited about Jaden Daniels. I feel like we're getting very nitpicky here. And I feel like, again, this coaching staff can get greatness out of either guy. And I feel like no matter who we end up taking between those two, we're going to be great. We're going to be strong playoff contenders and Super Bowl contenders before you know it. I'm not saying this next immediate season, but I'm telling you, we're going to be happy with either guy. And then secondly, I've yet to take Drake May in any of my mock drafts so far, and I've already done like five or six of them. So I felt like, you know what, let's go ahead and show him some love while everything is trading, trending towards Jaden Daniels. Let's switch it up and go with Drake May. Just to show Drake May a little bit of love again. I prefer Jaden Daniels, but let's switch it up and give Drake May some love. And plus, even though the national media and NFL insiders feel like it's more likely going to be Jaden Daniels second overall to the commanders, most mock draft analysts are still leaning towards Drake May. It's like a big divide between the national media and people inside the NFL to like mock draft analysts like Trevor Sycamore, Connor Rogers, Walter Football, all of those type of guys. But we're going to run with that today. We're going to choose the draft analyst side. And for the purpose of this mock draft, since we have so many picks to make, I really want to focus on his positives. We're not going to do a full 30 minute to an hour breakdown just on him alone which i could do i've already done like a full breakdown of Jaden daniels versus drake man exactly who's better at what in like an over 30 minute over like almost 40 minute video if you want to go check that out if you really want a deeper breakdown on drake may but today we're more so focused on his strengths and things like that i really want to focus on his positives and i'm gonna break down every quarterback's like biggest weaknesses and strengths and things like that later on later in the draft process but since this is a mock draft i'm just here to hype them up basically as if we just drafted them and i'm trying to see the vision that the commander's front office and coaching staff have basically looking from their eyes why did they take this guy so we're going to focus more so on the strengths but we will bring up some of the weaknesses and also after drake may said in an interview that it would be awkward to get drafted to, to the same team that his close friend sam howell was on that pretty much sealed the deal for howard to end up getting traded up out of here and I wouldn't be surprised that all of how was traded because they do want May. You, I wouldn't be surprised at all. And as far as Drake May specifically, let's get to him. Well, first of all, I love this quote from Hayden Hinks. Quote, Drake May is trending towards a split decision among credible draft analysts right now. I've seen one of the best draft prospects of the decade from some people to frustrating feat accuracy and decision making from other people, unquote. And it's literally that. You either love him or hate him. There really isn't much of a middle. I love Drake May. I just personally prefer Jaden Daniels. But I mean, again, you either love or hate this guy. And the best way to describe his positives and ceiling is honestly basically just look at Justin Herbert, in my opinion. I don't really see Josh Allen as much specifically, me personally, but I can see some Justin Herbert a little bit. Maybe not like a perfect 100% comp, but I mean, his ability to make every throw, whether it's off platform or with a defender grabbing on him, a while off balance, a while, while on one leg. I mean, if we're just talking just purely arm ceiling, he may have the highest ceiling in the class. I like Jaden Daniels and Caleb Williams' ceilings more just because of their mobility, even though Drake May's mobility is very underrated but if we're only talking arm ceiling may is up there right with caleb williams the inconsistency scares me and the missing the wide open receivers for absolutely no reason at times does as well but when he's on he looks like one of the best quarterback prospects in years i can admit that when he's on if you're only looking at a highlight tape of his good plays only you would think he was quarterback one easily and if you believe in this staff's ability to take elite traits and then just get those elite traits and plays out of a quarterback far more consistently than he did in college, then this is your guy. In his bad games, he did look really bad, but in his great games, he's making throws into the tightest of windows with bad receivers and a bad offensive line. And even though I feel like drafting a top tackle later in the first round, which we're going to do again, we're going to trade back up into the first round. I feel like our offensive line will actually end up being good, but Drake May doesn't necessarily need it to be. Per pro football focus, Drake May has faced pressure on an insane 347 of his 1,056 dropbacks over the past two seasons. He's thrown for 17 touchdowns and seven interceptions in those situations, which is really good, like really exceptionally good statistically. While Jaden and Caleb can make a bad O-line look good with 
their legs per se even though i feel like they can also do it with their arms drake may can also make an, a, ba a bad offensive line look good with his arm and quick decision making but also somewhat with his legs as well and his legs again are underrated he's also pretty good at staying on schedule and on time with structure and a defensive-minded coach like a Dan Quinn is going to prefer the off-schedule king and a guy like Jaden Daniels. But an offensive coordinator will probably prefer Drake May because he will do what Cliff asks him to do more often, more consistently, which will make Cliff look like a genius. So even though I feel like Jaden Daniels is the better overall schematic fit for Cliff Kingsbury's offense, Drake May is definitely the better ego fit for Cliff Kingsbury if he cares about something like that. Like an offensive coordinator wants you to do things the way that they say to do it. And like, I mean, w w putting in all of those hours and days and weeks of work for you just to go out there and just do your own thing would probably frustrate an offensive coordinator. And so... I feel like an offensive coordinator would also want to take a lot of credit for you balling out and things like that. So, of course, also durability wise, Drake May has that, too. I mean, as far as his build, I can expect him to take more hits. And maybe Adam Peters plays it safe with the quarterback that can take on more hits and things like that. And again, I personally prefer Jaden Daniels, but I really like both. And if we ended up taking May, these are just some of the reasons that y'all should be happy about it. But I'm going to do a way deeper breakdown on his strengths and weaknesses in another video that will probably be over like 30 minutes in itself. But we for sure do not have the time to do that in this video because then we'll be here for two hours. So moving on, round one. Pick 18th overall after we traded back up into the first round. I was taking offensive tackle Olu Fashanu from Penn State, born and raised in Maryland. And of course, y'all know that outside of Joe Alt, I prefer probably a Marius Mims just simply because I'm just the type of guy that usually bets on the highest ceiling and the most elite traits. But first of all, I've already mocked Amarius Mims to us like two times already, like maybe even three. And also, Olu Fushanu has a crazy high ceiling as well. Not the height of an Amarius Mims, but again, I just feel like Amarius Mims has the highest ceiling I've seen of a tackle coming out of the draft in years. But again, Olu Fashanu ceiling is still very high, very crazy. Also, I feel like a lot of people haven't noticed that Olu Fashanu is still only 21 years old. Like people talk about Drake May having a high ceiling simply because he's only 21 years old and his best days are ahead of him and things like that. And Olu Fashanu is a few months younger than him. And so he hasn't even scratched the surface of what he will be, I feel like, in my opinion. And he's been falling down a lot of people's draft boards lately, though. Just months ago, it seemed like most people thought he would be the first tackle taken in the draft. Now, a lot of people suddenly feel like he will not even be one of the first three tackles taken now. Pro Football Focus has him ranked fourth behind Joe Alt, Talese Fawaga, and Troy Fatanu. So him making it to the 18th pick, especially with a potentially big run on quarterbacks and wide receivers early in the first round, especially the first half of it, it's actually very possible now. I would have never thought two months ago you could go to Fashanu with the 18th overall pick, but now it's starting to really look that way. And I guess maybe I'm still one of the very few people that's still very high on him. He tested very well at the combine, first of all. He ended up earning a 9.49 raw athletic athletic score out of 10 his size was yellow for good and both his speed and explosion were green for great his vertical of 32 was elite too let's just go ahead and throw that out there 90th percentile level and according to RAS, only 66 tackles drafted in the NFL since 1987 have been more athletic than him and again, he's only 21 years old, so not only has he not scratched the surface in his playing and production ceiling, but he may not have even reached his physical ceiling just yet either. And I personally trust this coach's staff to develop traitsy guys like Olu Fashanu, and I trust them to get closer to people's ceilings rather than their floors. And I can see how some people are afraid of him being so inconsistent at the college level and projecting him to be that same way at the NFL level, and that he ends up just being another talented tackle that doesn't figure it all out. But I can also see how some people feel like he has a Trent Williams level ceiling, even though to me personally, I don't like the Trent Williams comp that much. Because if anything, Trent Williams' run blocking is arguably his best trait. Whereas Olu Fashanu's pass protection is far ahead of his run blocking at this point. So I feel like his real ceiling comp is probably closer to a healthy version of Tyron Smith if he gets developed the right way. And even if we don't trust Bobby Johnson yet for what he did with his time with the Giants as an offensive lines coach, I'm confident that Anthony Lynn can also help a lot as well. And the offense 
from Cliff Kingsbury, he can design it to where we can kind of work around the offensive line's weaknesses and, and basically build an offense and do play calls based around their strengths. So I'm sure if somehow, if somehow Olufashanu makes it to the 18th overall pick and we've traded back up to that spot, you sprint to the podium to get that guy because that's too much talent. He has top 10 talent in this draft, in my opinion, but things will happen think people are going to overlook his film and things like that and not be willing to take a 21 year old that's still pretty raw in certain areas pretty inconsistent you sprint to the podium to get him plain and simple moving on next up round 240th overall love is taking edge chop robinson from penn state another born and raised maryland guy right here as well that's two in a row well first of all several draft analysts still have chop robinson making it to our 40th pick in their big boards even after killing the combine somehow and to further back my point to how this is possible let's go back to montez sweat remember montez sweat did even better at the combine than chop robinson did chop had a crazy 9.68 ras score while sweat had a 9.9 and sweat had more sacks in his final season in college than chop robinson had in his final two seasons of college and sweat was doing it in the sec as well and even after all of that montez sweat still went 26th overall in the draft and we traded up to get him without us trading up for him he may have fallen even further than that so montez sweat was a better prospect coming out of college in pretty much every way and yet sweat may have fallen into the 30s if we didn't trade up to get him also, I do want to point out the fact that I'm still a big Darius Robinson fan. And even though I feel like he has an underrated ceiling, with Adam Peters bringing in so many dependable veteran edge rushers that can contribute right away, I feel like we have given ourselves the leeway to draft the higher ceiling guy rather than the higher floor guy. So with our free agency moves, we can now take the guy that may not be ready to start immediately and then basically just bet on his eventual development into the better player long term between him and Darius Robinson. We're talking about Chop, of course, both Robinsons, but it's Chop versus Darius right now. Hopefully at some point in their rookie season, I would hope that Chop would eventually pass Darius Robinson, but who knows? I'm expecting Darius Robinson to obviously be the better player day one, but I, with Chop Robinson ceiling, I wouldn't be surprised if he ends up passing them at some point in their careers early on especially if he goes to the right coaching staff. And I feel like he can literally grow into like a Brian Burns type of guy if he puts it all together, though. And that's a pretty big if. Somebody brought up a great point that he has a very similar body type and test into a guy like a Dwight Freeney as well. So maybe you want to comp him to him. I'd be happy with either of those ceilings. Give me Brian Burns or Dwight Freeney in the second round, early second round, but still the second round, and I'm doing backflips. And even though his tape is great, that severe lack of production is definitely going to scare a lot of teams away. A lot of teams draft based solely on production or it's like one of their top priorities. And this guy, without any serious injuries, somehow his highest sack total in a single season was 5.5. That's very alarming. And that was two years ago. That wasn't even the 2023 season. I believe he only had four sacks this past season and played in double digit games. But speaking of ceiling, if Dan Quinn wants to find and develop his commander's version of like a Micah Parsons, this is probably your best bet in this upcoming draft. Same exact height and athleticism and explosion, quick first step, all of that. But Chop is almost 10 pounds heavier. Now, I'm not saying that he's going to literally be Micah Parsons at all, but who was the coach that saw Micah Parsons as an off-ball linebacker, basically a middle linebacker, and found a way to turn him into an elite pass rusher? Our new head coach, Dan Quinn, paired with our new defensive coordinator, Joe Witt Jr. I'm very sure that Micah Parsons would have been an elite player at the NFL level no matter who drafted him. But Dan Quinn deserves a lot of credit for realizing that Micah should be going after the quarterback far more and then developing him into that player, even though he came into the NFL with a, without a lot of pass rush experience. And if anybody could take an elite pass rush traitsy guy and develop them into an elite pass rush production guy is Dan Quinn. And again, that's two Maryland guys in a row. So why not? Now moving on. Next up, round three, 67th overall pick. I was taking wide receiver Xavier Leggett from South Carolina. AJ Brown. Let's just go ahead and get that out the way. Literally, AJ Brown, just straight up. And even though AJ Brown went 51st overall in the draft, I feel like Leggett may be available much longer than that. 
because first of all he's more raw coming out of college and also way less productive aj brown had 2984 receiving yards in three years at old miss xavier leggett had only 1678 yards in five years at south carolina and maybe you could blame Spencer Rattler for some of that or maybe even so blame the South Carolina coaches for not knowing what talent they had on their hands and what potential they had on their team and not getting the most out of them. But either way, A.J. Brown had that 2,984 2, yards in 34 games while Xavier had that 1,678 yards in 53 games. So the ceiling is definitely there, but his lack of production until he just had 1,255 yards receiving this past 2023 season may scare a lot of teams away from taking him before the third round. And that's our chance to swoop in, especially with Curtis Samuel leaving in free agency. Wide receiver is a bigger need for the commanders than most people probably realize. And I like Jamison Crowder a lot, but he's probably wide receiver three right now, at worst wide receiver one, which is not ideal. That's not the game plan going into the week one of the regular season, man. And that's the beauty of what we did in free agency. Cause outside of quarterback and tackle, we could draft what we want in luxury and upgrade and ceiling rather than just filling in holes and needs that we have we're like outside again of quarterback and tackle we don't just have a dire glaring need where it's like man we gotta get a guy for that even if he's not the best guy available at that point regardless of position we need to fill that position so bad we just gotta take a guy even if we don't love him thank goodness we don't have to do that outside of quarterback and tackle and even then this is a great draft and we have great picks potentially especially if you trade back up into the first to get a quarterback and a tackle so i'm not really worried about that at all but even outside of just going best player available and i feel like xavier is literally that i feel like xavier can literally turn into aj brown without the attitude now outside of production let's just go ahead and get the rest of his concerns out the way first of all he doesn't yet show the nuance of finding open spots in zone coverage he seems to kind of be lost there for some reason easily coachable he also tends to be a body catcher at times but we've seen receivers that can succeed as occasional body catchers terry mclaurin does it a lot so it's not ideal it's not what you look for in a receiver but it doesn't have to necessarily be a receiver's achilles heel and now positives a lot of them in my eyes in my personal opinion especially if we're talking traits and potential first of all he's literally built like a linebacker like literally matter of fact he's only four pounds lighter than brian robinson coming out of the draft and we know how brian robinson treats dbs and even linebackers and defensive linemen at times now take brian robinson and make him run a 447 40 yard dash instead of a 453. Same height and everything, which takes me to his RAS, his raw athletic score. Xavier has a 9.66 raw RAS with elite explosion. And running a 447 to 221 pounds is just pretty crazy in general. And he outruns corners way smaller than him on his tape at times. So I feel like he's honestly even faster on tape than he ran in that 40 time. And then he's a contested catch god. And just like Terry McLaurin, both occasional body catchers, but still find a way to come down with the ball, even with a lot of contact. He also has a great release and is elite at beating press coverage. People aren't even going to try him like that at the NFL level after seeing what he did in college. And then on top of all of that, he's very quick and agile and can change directions way better than somebody his size should. If you can get him to improve his route running, he's going to be scary, man. But you already have the floor in Terry, Jahan, and Jamison. So let's bet on some traits with a guy like Xavier. Xavier is the type of receiver that scares defensive coordinators to death while trying to game plan for him because they know there's no singular DB out there that can match up with them physically. Either you're smaller than him or you're smaller than him or both a lot of the time. It's going to take a great game plan and probably more than one DB any given snap to focus on stopping a guy like this. And you won't be able to do that with a Terry and Jahan on the other side. I've seen some people potentially compare him to like a DK Metcalf type of guy. If you want to look at him like that, but just shorter. I feel like AJ Brown's a little bit closer, but I can see either one. Also, so far, everybody we've taken in this draft is in a four-state radius of Maryland and the Carolinas so far. Let's see how this keeps going. Next up, round 378th overall, I've just taken linebacker Junior Colson from Michigan. And first of all, it's only right to take at least one player from a national championship winning team. You just got to, man. I did it with my mock drafts after my Bulldogs won back-to-back. -back. That wasn't just purely 
Bulldogs. That was just national championship more than anything else. You won the championship for a reason. That logic led to us getting Jonathan Allen and Deron Payne. But not only is Junior Colson from a championship defense, he's from a team where a lot of people, including me, are not very high on the quarterback that won that championship. Or at the very least, everybody can admit that the quarterback didn't have to do much because the team around him was so great. So Junior Colson was a part of that team that was so great that the quarterback was able to win a championship without even having to do a lot. To become, doesn't matter how high you are on JJ McCarthy, that team was so great. He didn't even have to do much. And Junior Colson was a big part of that. I'm higher on Junior Colson than most, me personally. But a lot of big boards out there have him making it to this pick. ESPN has him at 82nd overall, Draft Tech has him at 90th overall. And I hope they're right. Please. Plus, he also didn't participate in the combine nor Michigan's pro day due to injury. So that may cause him to fall even further than projected as well. And remember, Adam Peters found Fred Warner in the third and Dre Greenlaw in the fifth. So have faith in him to find the right guy as well. And I believe Junior Colson could be on his radar. Let's go ahead and move on to who he is. He's a perfect fit for what we have going on right now. Perfect. After what we did in free agency, let me just break it down like this. Bobby Wagner is the oldest player in our linebacker group right now by far. And we have Frankie Louvu, who is an elite blitzer, pass rusher, and solid in coverage while also being a great run game defender. But his most elite trait is destroying interior offensive linemen and running backs while going after the quarterback. Then Jamin Davis is moving to a Micah Parsons-like role where he's going to rush the passer from the edge. Frankie Louvu's coming straight up the middle more times than not. Jamin Davis is coming from around the edge to attack the quarterback. And then, of course, he's also going to cover. And then... He may try to stop the run occasionally, but he's more so going to be going after the quarterback and covering, if anything. But Bobby Wagner, especially at this age, will be able to focus purely on stopping the run while also occasionally covering, of course. So we don't really expect Bobby Wagner to be here long term. And then we already have Frankie and Jamin for rushing the passer. Why not take the big run stuff at linebacker who can also cover and who's biggest flaw to his game is rushing the passer i feel like it's like the perfect puzzle piece and of course he would be a part of a linebacker rotation in games early on as like our linebacker for especially in short yardage and goal line situations but he could take his time developing while bobby wagner starts this year and then if we want to let wagner walk after the 2024 season we will already have a guy with one year of development in joe witt jr's system that squeezes in as the perfect schematic replacement for bobby wagner Three things you can bet on him being consistent at and great at for Junior Colson is tackling, then toughness and attitude, which Dan Quinn and Joe Jr. will love, and his coverage instincts. Again, you have Frankie Louvu rushing the passer from the middle and covering. You have Jamin Davis rushing the passer from the outside and covering. If you want a guy that's purely focused on stopping the run, that's his main priority. Basically, what Bobby Wagner is going to do this year, Junior Colson is this guy, and he also can cover as well. He has great coverage instincts and all of that, so this is like the perfect fit. This is one of the best fits I can find in this entire mock draft for what we need and what we're trying to do on defense and also based on who we already have on the roster especially in that specific position group then round three 100th overall have us take an offensive tackle patrick paul and now this is the spot where i would have taken cornerback the cornerback that i'm gonna put y'all on to later in the draft but again i may save that to do it like a deeper dive into him later on in another mock draft and again i'm acknowledging the fact that we more than likely should go corner with this pick i feel like corner is definitely the more likely pick i feel like corner is probably even more of a need but i wanted to really put y'all on the, to patrick paul from houston right now man. i really do i don't know about y'all but even though he played better the second half of last season, I'm still a little uneasy about starting Andrew Wiley at right tackle all season long. I'm scared, dog. I'm not going to lie. If he can promise me he will look like November and December version of himself from last year, then maybe I'd be okay with it. But until then, I'm taking a high upside developmental tackle to learn behind Andrew Wiley until he's ready. I know we already have Braden Daniels, but he was literally unplayable last year, and I have no hope of him suddenly being good that quickly with just within just one year. I feel like he was that raw. 
And Braden Daniels is the last regime's experiment. He doesn't have anything to do with Adam Peters, Dan Quinn, or Cliff Kingsbury. So we need a new high ceiling project tackle to develop. Patrick Paul is a great ball of clay to start with and develop. I mean, great. He has the longest wingspan of all tackles in this draft at 86 and 6 eighths. That's crazy. And then he also has a strong punch and a very strong grip. His inconsistency with his hands are coachable. That's a very coachable concern. But when he does get his hands on people, it's over with for them that play. They're done. They're taken out of the play. He also needs to work on his pad level. And he needs to stop dipping his head like when he's doing run blocking sometimes. Like he just has a propensity to like dip his head when he starts making contact with people and trying to push them forward and things like that. Which also is like a film thing that we can use against them. Like if you're an opponent and you notice, okay, he's dipping his head, that means they're running the ball. That's like an obvious sign. A linebacker even see that and use that against them. So we definitely got to coach that out of them. Even just beyond the fact that dipping your head is just stupid and it's not a good way to block somebody. But even on top of that, people are going to use that against them in film study. So we we got to get that out of him immediately. And I feel like all of those concerns that I just gave you are all coachable. So I'm not too worried about that. He has things that you can't teach as far as like natural God-given ability. And then he has things that are missing that are all things that can be developed with coaching and practice. So I, I, this is the guy you take a chance on. I'll take a chance on him any day, especially in the third round. If he does put it all together, I can see him being a taller and heavier version of Andrew Thomas, like literally an elite pass blocker and a really good but inconsistent run blocker with very long arms. One of the 20 best tackles in the NFL type of thing, which is lit, was still really good. Like he was second team all pro as an Andrew Thomas as of just 2022. But that's only if everything comes together for Patrick Paul, which is why he could very possibly end up being available this late into the draft. Drafting people who are not day one ready in the third round is actually pretty wild. That's not supposed to be normal. Rivera and Mayhew just made it seem normal by consistently doing that. But I'm at, for this situation, this case specifically, I'm willing to take a chance on the guy with a ceiling again in the third round. Again, drafting non-starters in days one or two is still pretty crazy to me. But it also helps that we would have th this guy will be our sixth pick up to this point in the draft. So we could afford to reach on a ceiling with five other day one and two picks already before we got to this one. And the free agency that we had helps us go more based on best player available, highest ceiling, rather than just picking the floor and the safe guy. Now, round five, 139th overall, I was taking tight end Theo Johnson from Penn State. A third Penn State player on one mock draft, and that was definitely not on purpose. Y'all know I'm a diehard Georgia Bulldog fan, and if anything, it's a shame that Penn State had this much athleticism and ceiling on that team and still didn't win any anything meaningful last year. To have Olu Fashanu, Chop Robinson, and Theo Johnson, I mean, just the drastic underdevelopment and underutilization of these just elite talents is, is just absolutely insane to me. But also, I thought about taking Ben Sanat here since I've already taken Theo Johnson johnson in a mock draft before but come on dog again with the way that we handle free agency i would much more prefer to draft ceiling over floor i like the talent that we already have here especially if zach Ertz is healthy he brings a nice floor and i would prefer some ceiling ben Sanat is more floor but theo johnson is the definition of ceiling out of all of the elite raw athletic scores that i've already given you so far in this mock draft theo johnson's is the highest he has a 9.99 ras out of 10 almost perfection only one tight end drafted since 1987 has a higher raw athleticism score than him great size great agility elite explosion and elite speed based on the charting being six foot six 259 pounds and running a four five seven forty time is literally unfair but he's also strong when run blocking he's not just this pure pass rush specialist if anything he's actually further ahead in his blocking technique than he is his actual pass catching technique and receiving ability you don't even have to take him off the field on early downs and obvious run situations. You draft him to be able to contribute immediately with this good floor as a strong but fairly still inconsistent inline blocking tight end. But then you also bet on his crazy high ceiling as a pass ga game mismatch over time with some development. I mean, let's go back to his combine real quick. 
Do y'all not understand how ridiculous his combine performance was? Do you know that Theo Robinson is the only tight end in the combine since 1987 when they were tracking this stuff to weigh over 255 pounds, run a sub 4 6 40 time, and post a vertical of over 40, 39 inches. My fault. Post a vertical over 39 inches. 255 pounds, sub 4 6 40, and a vertical of over 39 inches. Only tight end to ever do that since we've been tracking any of this stuff since 1987. Only tight end ever. And I'll take my chances on a player like that any day, please. But especially after we already have some pretty good talent in the tight end room, we will hopefully not need Theo to produce immediately. But again, he's also a strong but inconsistent blocker. And we can maybe coach and develop him into a more consistent and dependable blocker by week one after he gets here. So I'm expecting him to be able to at least be a part of the rotation as of week one. But I'm not expecting him to reach his ridiculous ceiling by week one at all. But that's something we can bet on we have them for the next four years we'll work on that man and i'm honestly still unsure how people still have them in the 150 of their big boy ranks i could easily argue that he's a still at 139th overall but some people would argue that he's a reach i think he can literally be a far more athletic version of zach Ertz if he puts it all together but we have to see round 7 222nd overall pick i was taking safety tyler owens from texas tech and first of all Yes, this is the guy that said he doesn't believe in space. Whatever that means, dog. I'm just going to ignore that. We're going to keep it pushing. Moving on from that, this guy is an athletic freak, like pure alien, which is actually pretty ironic. You see what I did there? At six foot two, 216 pounds, and a 95th percentile wingspan of 79 and 6 8 inch arms. And he had a 41 inch vertical and had the longest broad jump of any DB at the combine with a 140. 46 and he was projected to run at least a 4-3 flat 40 time he said his goal was to run somewhere in the four twos so but he ended up getting hurt but you can argue he would have been the mvp of the combine if he could have done all of the testing without getting hurt and yeah he's raw in a lot of areas but dog give that athletic freak to dan quinn joe with jr and jason simmons and see what happens i don't even know what a ceiling comp would be to give this guy because he may be one of the most athletic nfl players of all time not even just safeties but just all of nfl every position included and then he also shows some pretty good instincts to build off of coming out of college and he's a very willing run supporter and not afraid to hit it all dan and joe wood jr will fall in love with this guy's mentality athleticism and play style man him and jeremy chin in the safety room would automatically give us the highest ceiling safety tandem in the entire nfl i'm not saying the best at all but at least the scariest from an athleticism standpoint and it's sadly because he got hurt running his 40 time we never got the testing enough testing for him to qualify for an official ra score like ras but i'm sure it would have been a perfect 10 if he did or a 10 u type of thing again he's the alien of all aliens man and this late in the draft why not honestly seventh round i see draft boards having them go as high as 239 and as late as 253 and most draft databases don't even have them ranked at all so like undrafted basically so it's very possible that he does actually make it this far and i truly believe he could end up being one of the draft's biggest deals if he does it's amazing how far off the radar he's gone with him being a former five-star prospect according to 247 sports coming out of high school i did not forget me personally i've been keeping track of this guy i was wondering where he ended up i wanted him to go to georgia in that 2019 recruiting cycle when he was coming out of high school that's one of the main reasons i love recruiting because i watch a lot of these guys go from high school to college and then to the nfl and i'm already up on a lot of late round sleepers and gems just because they were very talented coming out of high school they were on my radar because of that and then whatever college they went to didn't develop them or maybe on their end they just didn't have the right work ethic or whatever happened and now they may end up going to the right nfl team and then that team can end up getting five-star talent out of them with the right development and everything else once he gets to the nfl level so this is literally what i do it for players like this i'm i'm heavy into recruiting i already just saw my georgia bulldogs get that 2026 five-star number one quarterback number one player in the class jared curtis to commit today so i mean i'm a heavy heavy i'm subscribed to like every recruiting source you can think of like paid subscription and all of that and i just love keeping i watch tape and everything and this is just one of those guys that i kept track of since high school and man i'm happy that i did because 
Man, he's even he's an even bigger athletic freak than I thought even coming out of high school. And I I really, really want my commanders to take a chance on him. I feel like Texas Tech didn't do a great job of developing him. And I feel like with the coaching staff, especially defensive coaching staff that we have here, they can get greatness out of this guy. Pure greatness. Pro bowl, all pro potential, but we gotta see. And then lastly, round seven, 237th overall level is taking cornerback Kyrie Jackson from Oregon. And we are now to the point with our very last pick in the draft, like I gave y'all the heads up earlier when i'm more so trying to give y'all another great option in the middle of the rounds of the draft so just to go ahead and get it out the way i doubt this guy makes it this far in the draft at all but i want to use this pick to put y'all on to a great player that even if we just just in case don't take a guy that we took like late third early fifth like again patrick paul which we took with the 100th pick overall i would want to use that pick to get this guy you take this guy as an alternative at cornerback and this guy is from upper marlboro maryland another maryland guy so i had to do it just off of the strength of that man that's three penn state guys that's three born and raised maryland guys and i feel like honestly the best way to start off his breakdown is to let y'all know that he was originally just like my boy tyler owens was a highly recruited prospect coming out of high school but instead of a five-star recruit this guy in Kyrie Jackson was a four-star recruit and he was recruited by Nick Saban and ended up transferring to Alabama from Fort Scott and then he ended up transferring again to Oregon from Alabama and basically just followed Dan Landon I'm assuming I guess that's how that went and the natural talent and traits are there for sure I think he's more likely to go somewhere like in the 90s of the draft maybe make it to our 100th overall pick and with us signing so many corners in free agency especially like a michael davis who i feel like if he can get back to his 2022 self will end up actually being our best corner i feel like we can wait until later in the draft to get a guy like a toolsy guy especially like this and expect the group of like emmanuel forbes st juice and michael davis to play very well and hold that cornerback position group down and quad martin can play some nickel if you need him to while also primarily being like a strong safety so i feel like cornerback is a need but it's not like a break glass in case of emergency type of need so if we don't go corner until late in the draft i think we will be okay but i do advise against making that decision i say you more than likely end up taking corner within from one of those three third round picks that we have but going back to Kyrie jackson this guy is six foot three really long arms and ran a 4 5 40 time and had an 1101 broad jump and his ras was a 9.42 again another athletic freak and i think he will be a great fit for dan quinn and joe with junior's defense all of our top three projected starting corners are very long say juice is six foot three very long michael davis six foot two very long and forbes can literally tie his shoes while standing up dog and Kyrie would fit right in with that description of cornerbacks also based on what i've seen in his film he projects best as a press man corner that takes risk and coverage and that's literally what dan quinn and joe jr want in their corners especially with the pass rush that they're going to scheme up and develop in front of him so he doesn't have to cover for forever you just lock a guy up disrupt his routes throw him off of his throw off the time in between the receiver and the quarterback just give us two seconds two to three seconds of coverage and the pass rush is going to get there you're good that guy perfectly fits that scheme and play style so again if we don't take patrick paul in the third round you better take kyrie jackson from oregon i mean the fit is just too perfect but yeah man that's the end of this video please get in the comment section let me know how you feel about everything discussed in this video please stiff arm that like button stiff arm the subscription button and stiff arm the bell next to that subscription button so you get a notification each and every time i release an informative and opinionated video just like this one man i really appreciate y'all big time Thank y'all. If you made it this far in the video, you're the real GOAT, man. Big love for that. Make sure you leave a like on the way out. Of course, get in the comment section and let me know how you feel about all of my picks, about it being very Penn State heavy, about it being very Sillin heavy, about it being very Maryland heavy as well. Let me know all of your opinions about every bit of this draft and like even sp for specific players, like how I took Chop Robinson as an edge rusher in the second round. Would you prefer Darius Robinson there? How I took Xavier Leggett in the third round 
as a receiver would you prefer a different receiver there of course let me know what your mock drafts currently are with the picks that we have especially at the sam howell trade are you willing to trade back up until the first round to get a top tackle or are you willing to just sit there with our first second round pick that we currently have in real life right now and just waiting to take whatever tackle is best available there let me know all of your opinions on this mock draft what you would do give me your example mock draft put me on to some players of course i don't have the ability and the time to know every elite player that's potentially coming out of this draft i have a few sleepers up my sleeve i still have a few more to give y'all too so be on the lookout for my next mock draft where i'm gonna put y'all on to some more great players especially like some high ceiling guys very athletic guys but let me know because again i'm not everywhere i don't know everybody so let put me on to some people in the comment section as well i'm gonna do my best to try to read and reply to as many comments as possible and i really appreciate y'all again stay tuned because i have so much content on the way shouts out to all of my pro bowl sponsors shouts out to all of my channel members because now we're getting to the point where i'm about to start doing draft film sessions for a lot of these prospects and a lot of that content will be exclusive to channel members because y'all are sitting here being channel members and basically donating to the stream every month like a subscription but like the least i could do is give y'all some exclusive content and the draft season is the best time to do that so stay tuned for that and man i really appreciate y'all i'm gonna catch y'all later i'm out oh.